Hello, and welcome everyone to yet another wonderful episode of Musical Jewel Box, where the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia talks to our wonderful guest musicians, conductors, composers, music directors, soloists, you name it, we got it. We think they're gems, and we want to showcase them like the jewelry that they are and keep them in a little box next to our bed, I guess. Maybe we shouldn't take that allegory too far. But this time around, we have David Hayes, uh, who's a longtime Philadelphia presence, who is uh, our conductor for the what was the November Death and the Maiden concert, which is being rescheduled to the springtime. Um, but he's going to talk to us about the composers that he selected on this. And we're going to dive deep into some communism, deafness, and uh, German folklore. So let's have David join us now. Hello, David. Hey there. How are you? How are you doing, Josh? Well, everything's great. I should also point out that, of course, it wouldn't be Musical Jewel Box, I've decided, if we didn't have something. So a uh, GNT all around. Well, you, you, you told me, so I, I broke out a kava, so. Beautiful. Beautiful and perfect. Um, <laughs> so hopefully everyone at home is enjoying whatever makes them happy in September. Exactly. So kind of like summer, but it's not quite fall. So I'm not sure what to do with that thematically, but... Uh, Either way. <laughs> so, David, tell us a little bit about your background. You've been in Philadelphia before uh, a couple of times. Uh, yeah, for a while. Uh, my, uh, I first came to Philadelphia in 1986 to study with Otto Werner Mueller at the Curtis Institute and in the conducting program there. Um, and uh, I ended up, uh, <laughs> I ended up after I graduated in 1989. Um, Michael Korn, who was the head of the Philadelphia Singers at the time, and also the uh, associate conductor of the Opera Company of Philadelphia, back then, now Opera Philly, uh, Opera Philadelphia. Um, and uh, he was looking for an assistant, and uh, I was graduating and looking for a job, uh, and I ended up uh, being chosen for his assistant for both at the Opera Company and um, uh, at uh, Philadelphia Singers. And I was there for as his assistant for two years, and then when he passed away, um, I became acting music director and then subsequently music director uh, at Philadelphia Singers, um, left the opera company at that point, but was back on staff at Curtis, where I've been basically 30 years uh, as staff conductor of the orchestra. I did a lot, did a lot of opera work at Curtis. Um, so up until uh, 2015, when I ended up uh, sort of transferring most of my activity to New York, um, the, uh, you know, my entire life from 1986, basically till 2015, uh, was centered around Philadelphia. And, and uh, we were at the time resident chorus of the Philadelphia Orchestra for a decade. We had a long history with the orchestra. And so uh, I, uh, and, and I should also mention that the chamber orchestra was the Philadelphia Singers resident orchestra. So we, uh, many of the of the uh, members of the ensemble I've known for many, many years uh, and have lots of fond memories of great performances together. So um, it, 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 it's very strange to me to be here talking to you from New York after all these years in Philadelphia, but uh, uh, Philadelphia has been a very important part of my musical life. Well, we're always glad to hear that, especially even if you defected to New York, you still <laughs> keep us close to your heart, which is always, which is always encouraging for the scrappy extra added burrow on here. Um, yeah, well, so I, never, I never say that. I know. I, oh, I, good, I, good. Believe me, I understand how Philadelphians feel about that sixth burrow thing, so. <laughs> well, we're super excited about this program that you've cooked up for us. And it's an all strings program. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just an all strings program. Mm -hmm. Each of the pieces is, is really all strings. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, we started out talking about a program based on, Forget it, I was getting, I guess I was in conversation with with Nathan Lofton um, about programming and what we might do, and uh, and and we sort of circled around the idea of doing Schubert Death and the Maiden, uh, uh, the transcription, the Mahler transcription for string orchestra, and then of course the question then became, well, what do we do with it? Um, and after kind of some various back and forths, uh, all kinds of different repertory that might work. Um, I, I settled on the other big companion piece being the Shostakovich Chamber Symphony Opus 110A, which is the transcription of the eighth string quartet of, of Shostakovich. Uh, and then uh, we wanted to fill it out just a little bit more. Um, and at the time, we anticipated this would be performed in November 2020. Um, so as a kind of a culmination from a Beethoven year, uh, that we should find, you know, that we should do some Beethoven. Um, and 
we had talked about maybe doing one of the other string quartet transcriptions, but uh, ended up settling on for time reasons and balance reasons in the program uh, on the, the Grosse Fuga, uh, the Great Fugue, uh, which was originally part of the 13th string quartet, but then he was convinced by his publisher to <laughs> that people wouldn't like it. <laughs> and it was too hard and too difficult and too crazy. So he, he took it off and was published as a separate piece. And we ended up with this program that is all transcriptions for string orchestra of originally string quartet pieces. Yeah, which I think I've never seen a concert. I mean, I'm not that old, but I don't know if the last time the chamber orchestra has ever done a program like that. So I'm really looking forward to it when yeah. we when we find a spot to, to throw it in there in the springtime. Um, so let's dive right into to some of the some of these pieces, especially the Grosse Fuga. I, I I feel like I remember the the time and place I was the first time I heard the Grosse Fuga, <laughs> and then kind of systematically went through my friends playing it to them like a drop the needle test and seeing if they could guess the year that it was written in. And they almost always said like the 1930s. And of course that glee comes across your face like, ah, it's Beethoven. Um, so it does certainly have a reputation for being, I have a quote written down here. Stravinsky himself said that it is an absolutely contemporary piece of music that will be contemporary forever. Friends playing it to them like oh, a drop. Oh, look at me, I'm talking on my own stream. Um, <laughs> So I would love to hear some of your thoughts on what is it about this piece that sounds so wild? Why does it sound so contemporary? And what is it that he does with the string writing that irked so many people when he, uh, when he wrote it in, what is it, 1826? Uh, 24, was it 24 or 26? Some, somewhere in there, somewhere around there. Um, you know, it's it's funny because there 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 are moments in the Grosse Fuga that remind me of the moments in the Ninth Symphony Fourth Movement and in the Misa Solemnis and the Agnus Dei, where where the orchest the orchestral fugue just kind of breaks out. There's always this this kind of in, in intense orchestral fugue that breaks out in these later works, and we know that in towards the latter part of his life, Beethoven uh, just kind of became obsessed with fugue as a as a vehicle and and um, so I think what causes people problem with this one, first of all, it's a double fugue. So it, it, it's, it's got double motives. You know, I mean, it, it, from a structural standpoint, we could spend four, four hours discussing from a structural standpoint, how it's held together and how it works itself out. But I, I think there's also this incredible sense that he just was not writing for anybody but himself. He was, he was writing for the future. He was writing what, what was in his head without worrying about constraints of, you know, I mean, there's a very famous, it's not even from this period. It's actually from much earlier uh, where, you know, some violinist was complaining about his violin parts um, and how difficult they were and how, you know, uh, how hard it was to play his, you know, his violin parts because of the demands he was making on the player. And there's this very, very famous quote where Beethoven says, well, what do I care about your puny violin when I'm talking to God? You know, uh, which <laughs> kind of sums up some of his, <laughs> think if you're a soprano and you're singing the Misa Solemnis, especially, and you get up to those high B flats in, in the Ed Vitam Venturi Fugue, and you can understand why he has that attitude. Um, so I think that what, what really made this piece problematic for contemporaries, now, mind you, lots of string quartets these days are so incredibly accomplished, they, they put it back as the final movement of that string quartet, um, rather than separate it out as a separate piece. But at the time, it, it was a little bit of a bridge too far technically. It was incredibly difficult technically. Um, and I think just because of the way he was working out the musical motives, it's an odd fugue subject, the, the at least the initial fugue subject. And he he went about it in such an episodic way with it, it it, it's not the kind of fugue that you would associate with Bach where there's a, you know, it's an exposition, then there's an episode, then there's a second voice entry, and then there's, a, I mean, there are those elements that are there, but they're layered on with all of this incredible, you know, romantic, chromatic pushing towards the future that sort of pull it um, from the more, uh, shall we say, expected norm of what a fugue might have been. And I think that just caused a lot of people problems. I, th I think they couldn't make head or tails of it. Um, and, and that's not unusual in Beethoven. There were so many Beethoven pieces all along the way where people just could not make head or tails 
of what he was doing and what he was trying to do. It's a famous, you know, he was commissioned to do the Mass and Sea. Um, and, and the person for whom he, he commissioned after he was commissioned by heard the Mass and Sea, and which by Beethoven standards is a fairly tame piece. Um, but <laughs> the, the response afterwards was just this like, you know, crickets, people didn't know how to react to it. And he said, you know, my dear Beethoven, what have you done now? <laughs> you know, I mean, this, this, inc but I, that, that's sort of the, re the reaction many people had to Beethoven. And in the late period where these works come from, and particularly the Grosse Fuga, I, I think it just, it, it was beyond where people were ready to, to start uh, receiving it. And as a result, it, it got this reputation for being this thorny, weird, bizarre, strange piece. Um, and that's, you know, that's why, you know, people think it's like, oh, it was written in 1930, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad you brought up um, Bach because not only is there a nice, you know, somehow sacred connection with the way they think about their music and they're not just writing it for rich people's court mm -hmm. dances. Um, but there's also, I, I was reading that um, there's some evidence to say that that initial fugal entrance that you're talking about is based on a melody from the well-tempered clavier. Not to mention, you were mentioning something earlier about perhaps the, the Bach monogram. Well, yeah, I mean, there's this, there's, you know, which then has references in the Shostakovich, as we've talked about. But, there, you know, obviously the famous Bach fugue subject on B-A-C-H. And in the German nomenclature, B is B flat, A, C natural, and H is B natural. So, you you know, the Bach used it as a musical monogram, and you can hear the da da de, de that that comes as a fugue subject. Um, the fugue that's in this, the beginning of this, and he even in the introduction to it before he kind of gets to the fugue proper, has a kind of an octave displacement, but it's not so dissimilar. There's like this weird familial relationship to it because the the, the grossa fuga has da, da, dee, da, that that's the fugue subject. That's the initial fugue subject. But if you take that displacement away. It's really eerily close to to the the, the Bach motif, um, which actually I find really interesting because Bach was not his favorite Baroque composer; it was Handel, um, and and he wrote lots of stuff that echoed Handel and everything. But it was there's this interesting kind of um, you know, meeting of the minds between Bach and Beethoven on this uh, fugue subject itself. So I don't know whether that's actually, you know, anything more than just a kind of a feels like it's a familial relationship, um, but there's certainly a flavor there. Yeah, well, I mean, God, we could talk about Beethoven all night, but I suppose we should probably keep moving on, really looking forward. If, if anyone watching hasn't actually listened to the Grossa Fuga, I mean, on one hand, I kind of want you to wait for the concert just so it can <laughs> blast your hair off, but you could also look it up online and it's, oh, it's wonderful, it's brilliant, and then you can go trick someone else and have them think that it was written in 1930. But right. I guess we can, uh, we can charge ahead and start talking about the, the Shostakovich, which mm -hmm. I guess this transcription it gets to be done enough that it actually is called his chamber symphony, though it was originally only ever meant to be the eighth, uh, the eighth string quartet. Yeah, no, it, and and he he did not do the transcription himself. Uh, it was Rudolf Barshai who did the transcription, but Shostakovich authorized the transcription. So it, it it wasn't just a kind of a posthumous thing somebody decided, as in the case of the Schubert and the Beethoven, where either Mahler or, or Weingartner decided it really had the weight to be a string orchestra piece. This was actually a piece that was well known during Shostakovich's lifetime as a as a string orchestra piece and as a chamber symphony. So it, it has its this kind of dual life um, in uh, despite uh, the fact that Shostakovich himself did not create the transcription. Um, I, you know, I find it's really fascinating this piece because um, he he wrote it very quickly uh, after a visit to Dresden in 1960. Uh, and in 1960, I mean, that's only 15 years after the end of the war. And so Dresden had obviously suffered immense damage from the firebombing in February uh, 45. Uh, and the, it, the, the sight of it so shocked him when he saw this. He just, he was there actually to write a film score. He, they, were, there was some, they were filming a, a different a, a film and he was there to sort of write the score for this film that had Dresden as a sort of a plot line, if you will. Um, and 
he was so overcome by the by the destruction of the city that he just kind of poured out this piece, which some people have described, you know, as a psychological lament, his own, you know, a requiem. In fact, he even at one point said, you know, you can use this piece as my requiem. This this is my requiem. Um, and and write it on the cover that <laughs> this this is this piece is a requiem for the composer. But he you know, we're talking about these musical motives. He often used, at least since the 1930s, Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk, I think is the first time it really appears, but he often used his own musical anagram, D-S-C-H, the first, if you go, if again, if you use the German lettering system, it's D, E flat, uh, C, and then B, natural. But this da da de da becomes his motto. And it's in, a, in it's in many many many. Yep, there it is. There it is. Um, he he put it in all kinds of pieces, but I'm not sure there's a piece where it is ever so more obsessively used. It it, it appears in every single movement. It it's it, it. There are moments where it 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 just simply is relentless. It just hammers away at this motive, um, and so clearly he's working out some kind of psychological demons. Uh, but it's it it's a really fascinating piece because it it as a string quartet it's it's just it's earth shattering as a string quartet, but it's equally earth shattering as a string orchestra piece. I mean it it is an amazing work from you know from a period that and again like I said he wrote it really quick like in three or four days. I mean some just like literally pouring it out of himself, um, and when he got back to to the Soviet Union. Um, he had it in his suitcase, and he was so depressed. I mean, there's a story that he was so depressed over this whole visit and the peace and everything that he contemplated suicide. He, he was he bought a bottle of pills and he told his friends. Of course, if you're going to tell your friends, you're <laughs> that's probably you don't really mean it. You're crying out, um, but you know he he literally said, I, "I'm done. This is my last piece. I'm I'm not going to compose anything more." Um, so it's pretty astonishing how this work becomes a work that is, again, it has a, a weight about it that a, that can take the weight of a string section, um, as a, and still at the same time be incredibly moving as a string quartet. So it, it it's one of the things I love about the piece. Yeah, and um, you know, we, when we talk about Shostakovich, I think we we very commonly always talk about how he was like this trapped in in Soviet Russia and and I also read earlier today that I mean he not only was did this coincide with his trip to see Dresden but he had just reluctantly been forced to join the communist party yeah, yeah. And so in that you said there's like this dedication and it's to like all victims of fascism and yeah, fascism and war mm -hmm. right yeah and something about being forced into like the 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 Soviet regime just in the in the same time period his own like trappings of, of being stuck in the system is uh, hmm. well I, I mean you know look I, I I I think it is very it's very hard for us to imagine what his life must have been like um and the just the constant feeling of someone looking over his shoulder all the time and that no matter what he did creatively um you know he either felt he was compromising himself to write party music um music of the party. I don't mean music to celebrate with. Um, oh, but I suppose there could be a, some oh, yeah, maybe it could be a, yeah, a really little cross thing. A party for the party. Um, but, uh, you know, he he was so uh, um, criticized by the authorities and and uh, the censors and, and, and the just, you know, the, the incredible weight of the system on him at all times and this incredible struggle to communicate something. And I think that, you know, maybe in, by 1960, I mean, he only had another decade and a half to live. Uh, by 1960, a lot of his most famous works were, although interestingly enough, really right around that period is when the Bobby Yar symphony comes. And that's another earth shattering, incredible piece uh, where he really kind of puts his, you know, thumb in the no in the eye of the system uh, by using uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko's poetry, which at the time was a little. Mm. Um, so I I I think just the weight of it by this time in this period in his life was so overwhelming that it, it 
you know, this piece comes out of it. And and it's it, it's interesting to me that he says, I I'm done. That's my last piece. I don't need to say any more. I've said it all. Um, and maybe that's why the kind of just obsessive use of that motive of his name constantly in the in the piece. Maybe maybe the, I'm sure there's a whole psychological dissertation in that. Yeah, and well, since we're we've really just we're in the cheeriest part of our conversation now, <laughs> yeah. I thought maybe we could bring it on to Schubert, uh, even though he had such fun parties, also rather a tortured soul, and the, the you know the big second half of this concert, the Death and the Maiden, mm -hmm. uh, which also again starts as a string quartet, but it doesn't just start as a string quartet, and then slowly through Mahler makes its way into a string orchestra. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the background of? The, the original quartet and its relationship to the song and where Mahler comes into all of this? Well, the, the, he uses the song as inspiration for the second movement. Um, and there, there's, there's an interesting kind of weird throughput for all of the movements, but he, he, this was the first quartet he had written. Uh, well, no, I take it back. The Rosamunda Quartet came just before this, but it, it was right after he had started as in, in the latter part of his life, sadly in Schubert's case, you know, that's not very long. Um, but in the mature period, if we want to call it that, um, he had returned to the, to the form of the string quartet, which he had left behind in his teenage years, um, even going so far as, as, as to telling, um, I think it was his brother, it's like, you know, don't bother playing my early quartets. There's really nothing in them. There's, you know, and I, which, which I think is kind of a fascinating thing, you know, of self-awareness or something. Um, but his mature quartets, which starts with the Rosamunda and then includes Death and the Maiden, and I, he planned a trilogy of quartets, I think. Um, and the the incredible vehicle of these late quartets for him to work out compositional ideas. He'd already gone and, and really begun moving in an interesting period from a symphonic standpoint. And now here in, you know, somewhere around 1824, I think, um, he's, uh, he's returning to this large form and working out, you know, bigger compositional ideas. And so this takes its uh, um, influence from the song, Death and the Maiden, uh, and he creates the second movement essentially using a lot of the motivic material from the song. And that's where it gets its nickname from because obviously he's using the song in the second movement. Um, the, the first movement is an incredibly worked out sonata form. I mean, it's really just absolutely amazing. The, the, the tightness of the composition in the first movement. Um, and then especially the last movement, the Tarantella, uh, which is an interesting choice for a movement, uh, a dance form that was associated with kind of, um, you know, a frenzy after the bite of a venom that's in it in Italy. The tarantella is the is the tarantula, and the idea was that you know the people that were bitten they would have to do this frenzy dance in order to kind of sweat it out and hope that death didn't claim them first. So there's this wild dance, and you you start sort of looking at the arc of the whole piece, and there's clearly there's absolutely no disguising. He, you know, Death and the Maiden is the central part of it. But then there's this sort of, if you want to call this sort of dance of death at the end, and the the beginning is 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 an incredibly um, uh, incredibly dire and overwrought piece. So he's struggling with something in the beginning. Um, it, it creates a really interesting, you know, sort of totality between uh, by using this song as a as a vehicle to, um, to, and we were talking a little bit about the idea of that, you know, that the, the original folklore of it was, and you can see paintings from the 16th century where, um, you know, uh, there was this German folklore had this, you know, often, you know, death would come near you and you would sense its cold breath and you would try and push it away. And particularly this legend of the, of the maiden who was, being kind of co-opted by death or, you know, and, and saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm pushing you away. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, briefly before we started, I mean, it turns out he was incredibly ill at this point. Um, he had been suffering from syphilis and he was having a really bad patch um, and he didn't live all that much longer. Um, so there's this, uh, 
again, there's this incredible weight in his life. And you know, when we think of Schubert, we think of these, you know, obviously there are these very serious pieces, but there's also, um, you know, the idea of Schubert is Vieni, Viennese gemütlich, you know, it's it, and in some of, of, of his writing, but we know what an incredibly tortured soul he was. Um, and then this, so this piece also is a string quartet transcribed then later for orchestra, but a string quartet by a composer who's incredibly tortured, incredibly uh, weighed down by the world in so many ways. And so there's this weird, for me, there's this weird connection between the Shostakovich um, and the and the Schubert, not to mention, you know, Beethoven. I mean, we can also talk about he's at the very end of his life too, and all of the war, the the you know, the tortured nature of his deafness and trying to compose. So there's all of this kind of wrapped around into all three of these pieces. Um, and it's not, the, I mean, the other, the other thing that's great about the Schubert is that it's not the only piece that he took a song as a, as a you know, inspiration for one of his own songs because the Trout Quintet is from Di Forella. So there's, there's all of these relationships between his songs and, and, it just shows you how important and, and how critical the the leader was to Schubert's development as a composer. I mean, it, it, it really is critical, the work through the leader and the cycles and everything into his larger compositional ideas. Yeah, and perhaps the most controversial one that I, I'm not sure either of us are completely convinced of, but for the benefit of our you know, I'm sure very studious viewers, uh, that I, I did read that there, someone, at least one person has made the argument that um, probably one of the most famous of Schubert's folklore lead, the Erlkönig, mm -hmm. um, that in the fourth movement Tarantella, after you get past the initial part, there's this second theme that takes over, uh, which could be lifted out of the Erlkönig. And I was listening to it like six times today and I, <laughs> I, I, it's it, it's like something. It's like the, when he when when he says his first thing to the kid, and then kind of like saying his last thing with the kid. The intervals aren't quite right, but the the mood is kind of there. So perhaps we can get we can get a real music theorist and musicologist on here who just wants to devote six years of their life to giving us a definitive answer, and then we'll bring them back in six years and see how and see how that works. Well, I mean, Earl Kernig, uh, that's a, not so dissimilar in terms of the legend. I mean, this, you know, this is, a, you know, child being taken, you know, but it's, it's, again, it's this sense of, you know, death taking, you know, overtaking a person. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure somebody could do a very good doctoral dissertation on that. Probably very successfully too. <laughs> very, very, and I, I bet you they'd wear black all the time too. But you know, just for just for the style. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, I think we're about at the end of our half hour, and I feel like I've already learned a lot, and I've spent you know the whole the whole of the week steeped in it already, and I'm still learning more. So thank you so much, David, for joining us and giving us all these incredible insights. I'm sure there's 16 million more things we could do. And when we get closer to the, uh, the actual performance, we'll, we'll make some more deep dives into this and we'll bring you back. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks for everyone for stopping in with us uh, from the comfort of their homes. Hopefully their drinks are nearing the bottom like mine is. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and the fridge is just a couple steps away because, hey, it's Thursday night. That's right. And and of course, uh, I would be remiss to remind everyone that we need your support now more than ever. And if you'd like to donate to the Chamber Orchestra, it's so easy. If you just go onto our website, there's a big donate button on the top right. You click that button, you put in like $16,000 and you hit send and you don't look back. It's gonna be great. And we're, we'll send you, I don't know, maybe we'll buy a little plush toy if you give us $16,000. That would be nice. A little... You have to do a hell of a plush toy. It would, maybe we can make a little Earl King. It'd be really fun. I mean, you could do that. A little Earl King. And you could do a whole series. You could do a Death and the Maiden. You could do an Earl Kearney. Oh. You know, I mean, you create a whole Schubert series. <laughs> the, the, the orchestra that gives away corpses killing maidens. <laughs> and make the news. But all right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, uh, we will see you next time uh, in October when we continue the Musical Jewel Box series. And... Have a good night. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you.